podcast felt more like, well, let's just get this over with more than the movie that we are about to discuss right now. Tonight, we are discussing, after three years and a lot of trailers, we are discussing Morbius. People all over the world have my disease. The cure is finally possible. Michael, it worked. Not exactly. There's something inside of me. Who wants to consume blood? Are you here to heal the world or to destroy it? I don't know. Morbius. Who are you, man? I am. I know. I'm just kidding. It's Dr. Michael Morbius. A new Marvel legend arrives only in theaters. Hello, everyone. My name is Jerome Cusan. I am the co-host of this year podcast, Hero Pantheon. Uh, on this episode tonight, we are going to be discussing the recently theatrically released Morbius uh, that has finally come out. Uh, Sony has been threatening to release this for the last three years, it seems, and it finally came out fittingly on April Fool's Day 2022. By the time you are listening to this, a lot of the discourse has already been had on this movie. And let's face it, there really there really isn't a lot to say. Uh, you can follow us on Hero Pantheon. That's where you can send feedback and things, uh, letting us know your thoughts on the movie. My co-host is Brian DeBrain. You can find him on Twitter, at Brian DeBrain. Okay, Brian, so I, th- there really is not a lot for us to talk about when it comes to this movie. But I have a theory that I would like to discuss with you. Okay, you ready? I'm ready. Okay, so we have Jared Leto as Dr. Michael Morbius. And I I don't know about you, I am totally Jared leto out. I never need to see him and his awful, awful accents in any other projects, whether they be TV or movies, in perpetuity. Uh, the method acting stuff, it's just terrible. Uh, he's also a pervert. He's a creep. Let's let's just dump Jared Leto in, in whatever fashion we can do so. Matt Smith as Milo Morbius. He is the absolute best part of Morbius. Brian, would you agree that he is the best part? Uh, Jared Harris, but that that's kind of debatable because I think Harris was completely wasted, but he was so good for the six lines that he had. Will you agree that Matt Smith was a, a positive part of this? Of the movie? Oh, definitely positive. Much, much, much positive to what the crap was in this movie. Okay, so let's. What if we switched Jared Leto and Matt Smith's roles? How would you feel about this movie then? Because to me, it, when I think about how Morbius looks, Matt Smith captures the look of Morbius better anyway. Yeah, because Morbius is supposed to have this European accent, right? 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 I I would say so. Yes. Okay. Then yeah, Matt Smith has a, has a UK accent. He's Doctor Who. I mean, I get the casting as to why you put him as the bad guy, but he does fit the Morbius like role better. Like going into this movie, I was thinking, man, what the fuck did they spend eighty five million dollars on? Because it's a fuck. I know it's a comic book movie, and you're gonna have your action sequences, but at the heart of this movie, it's supposed to be a vampire movie. Every other vampire movie costs like ten to fifteen million dollars to make. You know what I mean? So once they started showing all the action sequences, and I was like, oh, this is where they wasted their money. This is where they wasted their money. So the one thing I will say in response to that is this movie, I think, is very much a victim of the pandemic because of the fact that it was delayed numerous times. So that basically had to restart the marketing a number of times. I believe there are also some reshoots as well. Keep in mind, this was also supposed to come out before Spider-Man No Way Home at some point. So I'm sure that there were a lot of reshoots and rewrites that had to come because of that. Now, in no way am I defending the quality of this movie, but I will say that this budget ending up at $75 million, I could definitely see the pandemic having a lot to do with that. And perhaps there is a scenario where this movie is maybe budgeted at 40 to $50 million if it comes out when it was supposed to in 2020. See, I'm not even sure about that because all these reshoots and stuff that we've heard of, it feels like they changed nothing of the movie. The only thing they added was the tomb stuff at the end. Spoiler alert, which was annoying, but 
yeah, it just feels like a trailer after trailer after trailer, and then they keep showing uh, tombs in the trailer, and then those scenes are those scenes are not even in the movie, not even in the movie, and then we don't even have Morbius walking by that poster of Spider Man. Uh, with the murder thing on, not even in the movie. That was all just bullshit by Sony to get you to come into the theaters to think it is all connected. And then they came up with this bullshit ending to kind of ruin the ending of No Way Home to give you Adrian Toomes in the fucking Venom universe. Ah, ah, God, what a headache. What, what a headache. But, yeah, this movie uh, is a mess. And this is one of those situations where the post credit scenes actively harm the movie in some ways and i think that's really that is a huge concern of mine in terms of thinking about what spider-man is going to look like in the sony verse or whatever however this is going to work uh, because things are really messy right now again undoubtedly the pandemic has kind of had an effect but the, in what universe it, am i interested in seeing morbius tombs and venom together because let's face it the venom movies i i would say that this movie is more competent than the Venom movies in a lot of ways, but I think there is also an argument to be made that there is a lot more interesting stuff going on in the Venom movies, like Tom Hardy's performance alone, like the Venom Venom making out in the first one, Venom in the club in the second movie. Like there are some memorable scenes, and again, those movies I would not classify them as good, but I I could sit here and make the argument that those Venom movies at, at least have something to them. This movie is an hour and 45 minutes and it is it is very listless and it doesn't feel like there's there's really a point to anything that's going on this feels like a movie that was cut and paced directly out of the mid to late 1990s because they're trying to simultaneously jam all this stuff in there you know it's one of those things where you have you have Tyrese Gibson in this movie as a police officer right Tyrese Gibson who let's i would not say he's a good actor but He is very entertaining in the Fast and the Furious movies, kind of in his role, kind of as a sidekick, commenting on what's going on, making jokes. Coming into this movie, that's what I thought he was going to be, and he just wasn't. Like, he was lifeless. He didn't have anything to do, really, except deliver half-assed exposition. It, It was just a very strange movie on a lot of levels, and I don't... And I don't know, really know what else to say. Yeah, uh, Tyrese's role was very generic, and they didn't need to have a star name in that role. Like, his partner was a nobody. So if you're going to have the partner as a nobody, just make the other guy a nobody. You know what I mean? It's like, what? Like, we don't need Tyrese Gibson in this movie that bad that we have to, like, make that role more, you know, you know, credible or whatever, or pump that role up a little bit more. It was just not necessary. So, like... The other thing, too, that I, I feel like they wanted in this movie is, like, a feel for, like, a like a hammer horror movie. Does that make sense? Like, they kind of wanted that to be what this was at the heart of it. But with the budget getting in the way, it just became this overblown comic book movie by the end of it. Because, like, at the beginning, like, I was digging the story of two disabled friends that grow up together and they're trying to find the cure for each other's blood disease, right? That's a real heart, like, a story you can really dive into. Like, an independent uh, type movie or like one of those type of movies where it's like comes out of nowhere and you you pick like disabled actors to fill in the roles and stuff like that and that's the kind of vibe you had for the first five to ten minutes once he goes on the ship and turns into morbius the whole movie goes off a cliff and that's where it just goes like c- completely off and not only that but you had like entire scenes like missing like did you notice that too like it definitely felt like this movie was hacked to hell and i don't know if they really wanted this movie to be an hour and 45 minutes and they're like it cannot be any longer so i think that that that's certainly something that would not surprise me because this movie definitely felt like there were entire sequences and things cut out of it so like for example the biggest example of this that i I don't know if anyone noticed except me but like when milo goes to visit uh morbius in his lab right and he and he sees that he's taking the thing and that he's like a vampire now uh, I guess, like, without like, showing anything or whatever, he takes a vial and injects himself. And we never see any of this. All we just see is Milo turn into a vampire, like, a scene or two later. And I was like, what? How did he? But he didn't inject? What did he? Where did he get it? It I, I, doesn't matter. They just kind of skipped all over that and then went to this whole sequence where they just ripped off the usual suspects, uh, <laughs> which I was just laughing at. I was like, why are you ripping off the usual suspects when it's going to remind people of Kevin Spacey? 
I, I don't know. I, I, that was just me thinking like that. I was like, uh, why, why, why are we doing Kevin Spacey right now? So that kind of rubbed me the wrong way. Because if you notice, they shot it the same way as the verbal can't scene at the end of Usual Suspects. And I was like, oh, I, I get where you're going with this, but don't remind us of Kevin Spacey. Do something else. So that that was where my well, Jared Leto at. is in this movie, and uh, Jared Leto and Kevin Spacey certainly have their their own issues to deal with. That's for sure. Uh, that's putting it mildly, but I, I guess that's the connection, right? <laughs> Jesus Christ! But yeah, this uh, this movie is aggressively <laughs> mediocre. Like, it's one of those things where when we are trying to determine, oh, this should should this be in the uh, in the um, pile of shame or not, like. I can't really make an argument for this being in the pile of shame because it's just so consistently there. It's it's bad, but it's not bad to a point of being on self-parody. Like, it's clear, like, you watch a movie like Batman and Robin, it's like, this movie is bad. There are bad scenes, there's bad performances. This movie doesn't even necessarily have any of that. This movie is just existing on its its own plane and to me, the only things that make it stand out as being bad are the post credit scenes. But taken in isolation, the post credit scenes are not necessarily bad. It's just it makes the entire Sony-verse confusing. So I, I think that's where I really struggle with this movie and talking about it is that there really isn't anything notable about it except for the fact that we do see Vulture and we see Michael Keaton and that's that's it. I mean... You know, Danny, Daniel Espinosa is somebody who's done, you know, a couple of kind of, I would say, mediocre movies in the past as well. So I would classify him as a, as kind of a journeyman director. But I think uh, when you look at the totality of this movie, um, it's just a real nothing burger. And that's, I mean, it's it's unfortunate because it's very clear to me that Sony has a vision for what they want to do with Spider-Man and coming back to the Sinister Six, Sinister Six, like it's very clear that they that that is where they want to go. That is the direction that they are obsessed with heading with, because they kind of want their own team up. They want the action figures. They want all this stuff. And I just I don't know that it's going to work out because this movie, in terms of box office, dropped off seventy four percent between the first week and the second week. So I'm not going to sit here and tell you it's a bomb because. The movie was budgeted, as you mentioned, $75 million. The box office has been $128 million. Now, if you consider the pandemic and the marketing costs, presumably it's not necessarily a money maker yet, but I would also not classify this as a huge bomb either. But I, I think it's kind of a per, and we're in a purgatory because it clearly is not as successful as Venom. It's even not even going to have close to the success of of any of the Spider-Man movies or Venom or any of that business. So it'll be it'll be curious to know like how are they going to incorporate Morbius in the future? Is this a situation where they're gonna be like, okay, there won't be a sequel, but we are gonna pursue uh this idea of the Sinister Six and we are going to incorporate Spider-Man into that in some way. And how is this all gonna work? Is you know what is Tom Holland's level of interest in participating in all of this? I can't imagine a scenario where Tobey or Maguire or Andrew Garfield look at this and are like, yeah, I want to participate in this awful Morbius movie. I just, especially with everything that Andrew Garfield went through, I just can't imagine he want, him wanting to be involved. Like, to me, No Way Home was kind of a closure for him. And if he's never Spider-Man again, I think that's perfectly reasonable. I mean, unless, unless Sam Raimi's like, yeah, we're going to get the band back together and do Spider-Man 4. I also cannot imagine a scenario where that's happening. I just, I don't, I don't know what Tom Holland feels about all this. So that's kind of where I come down. And I, I don't really have a lot to say about the movie because it, again, it is, it is nothing. It is an origin story of a character that people barely care about. It is done in a very uninteresting way. Uh, Jared Leto's performance is very uninteresting and there isn't even like a weird accent or there, there there's nothing to his performance uh, Matt Smith, I, I would say, is the highlight of the movie. I wish he had been the lead character. I think he at least gets some stuff to do. I think he has a really fun dance sequence. Uh, you have uh, Adrian Arona as Martin Bancroft, who th they they want her to be AOC. It's just it's just very generic and lame. Like any like most of the interpretations and the um, the homages to AOC are. So, yeah, that's that's really all I have to say about this movie and. 
I mean, look, it's one of those things where I can't say I'm disappointed because I didn't really have any expectations for this movie anyway, so I'm not disappointed. But in the end, it just kind of felt like, well, that's the thing that happened. Now let's move on with the rest of our lives. See, my frustration is, is like, anytime you're trying to do a horror movie and a comic book movie at the same time, it's like, you're going to have to just compare it to Blade because that's kind of the standard. Blade 1 and 2, you know what I mean? To keep that balance of horror and comic book action. And they try to do it here, but I just felt like, the director was just kind of like, you know, didn't have that kind of expertise to do it. And uh, it's very unfortunate because I feel like based on the first 10 minutes before they go onto the ship and do all the fucking trans, uh, you know, they turn him into the vampire or whatever. Like there was like some potential there and I can kind of see it. And that's what's disappointing for me because like I can easily see this movie kind of rewritten where you can just make them like the disabled people they are. And then at the end of the movie, one of them turns into a vampire and you build up to it. You know what I mean? And then make the whole movie like this, you know, almost borderline independent drama and then build up to it. You know what I mean? And then you don't have to have CGI vampires flying in the fucking New York subway and and fighting each other on the top of rooftops like fucking like two flying superheroes. It doesn't fucking it doesn't click like look at all the old vampire movies like the hammer horror movies that they kind of inspired to be you know what i mean even the 90s animated spider-man morbius stuff they got influenced by hammer horror hammer horror is all about bright colors you see the blood bright you see all these bright colors and everything is kind of like wow in your face and then when the violence happens it becomes more startling because it's such a vivid vivid picture in your fa- in you know to see like the violent deaths from like the vampires with like christopher lee you know all that kind of thing back in the day in the 50s 60s hammer horror and they did it on a budget and i'm just thinking like if they can do that successfully in a budget 40 years ago, why can't we get a good vampire movie now where you tie it into this comic book universe? It's like, if Blade can do it, like, why can't Morbius do it if you had such a good... St- I don't know. It was just so frustrating to me because I saw, like, the potential there. And then later on as the movie goes on, the colors get darker and muted, and it was just like, this is not a good, like, palette, like a visual color palette. Like, totally the opposite of what I'm used to in, like, Marvel movies and stuff. And, like, by the end of it, it was just all gray, dark colors, and it was just so hard to watch the CGI sometimes. So that that's kind of where I was at. I was just really disappointed with, like, the visuals by the end, the way they used their money, the way they scripted it. It just could have been so much different, and you could have, like, grounded it more and made it much more of a feel of, like, a good movie. But I don't know why. Like, they had three years, three years to go back and fix some of this stuff, and they just chose not to. But they spent all the money on advertising and the extra money to add in um, Adrian Toomes coming out of the purple crack in the sky. So, like, if you had all that time and all that money, you could have just made a better movie and they chose not to. It just kind of frustrates me, man, because that kind of. Yeah, I think that Sony, it's it's very clear to me that Sony has absolutely no idea what they're doing. And the only reason that Spider-Man has been successful is because of the Feige slash Victoria Alonso slash um, everybody else who works at Marvel proper. Like, that's why those movies are good. The reason that Into the Spider-Verse or Across the Spider-Verse is going to be good is because of Lord and Miller's involvement and some of the people that they've hired, the directors, the writers. That's why those movies are successful. But in terms of producing these movies, you know, I don't know what Amy Pascal's um, involvement is with Morbius and Venom. Uh, compared to the Spider-Man proper movies, but there is a clear quality difference between what is happening in the animated universe and the Spider-Man universe compared to what's going on with Morbius and Venom. And I, you know, I don't, I, and I don't know what the future is going to hold because, uh, of course, um, Tom Holland is supposed to appear in at least one more MCU proper movie. Whether that's going to be Doctor Strange or not is an open question. But it's something that we're going to find out pretty soon, I am sure. And I just, I don't know what is going to end up happening because these movies are not working. Period. End of story. I think Venom and Venom 2, there are interesting aspects to them, but I don't think those movies have been good. They've at least been financially successful. So the argument can be made that they should keep going to an extent, but it's very hard for me to make the argument based on the quality of the movies. That is kind of where I end up. So look, when we come back and talk about this movie for the Pantheon of the Pile of Shame, 
I don't think it's going to end up being in the pile of shame, but that's only because there's just absolutely nothing to this movie in the end. And that, and in some ways that, that actually is more depressing because at least if it were fun, bad or bad in an interesting way, I feel like we could have had a conversation about that. Like we did with Catwoman, like we did with Batman and Robin, like even the 2015 fantastic four, I think we were able to talk about that movie because of how bad it was. And this just was bad on the most boring level. Uh, Craven the Hunter is going to suck. I can almost be assured of that now. And I have no faith in that movie. Aaron Taylor Johnson get, getting double casted in the quote unquote MCU is not a good idea. I don't think anymore. Craven's going to suck, man. And I guess that makes four of the Sinister Six that they want. And, and for the record, the reason we're saying that the uh, end credit scene makes no sense is because basically he, it's the it's the Venom universe, correct? So there, therefore, we got Adrian Toomes coming into the uh, the Venom universe inside a fucking prison cell, already in his jumpsuit, and he looks in the mirror, and all he has to say is, "I hope they have the same good food here," or "They hope they have good food here." Like he just went from a different universe, and he's not concerned at all that he's not going to see his wife and kid again. The one wife and kid, like the wife and kid, that was the prime reason for everything that he was doing in 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 this 2017 Spider-Man Homecoming. Like, like all that motivation's gone now, and he's just kind of like, oh, I'm in a different universe now. I think we should team up and fight a Spider-Man that's not even in my universe. You know, it, like from my universe, it's like I have no qualms with the Spider-Man because he's not my Spider-Man. But hey, let's go after him. What? Or the theory is that they may go in the direction of the Sinister Six or like the Suicide Squad, that they're going to be protagonists and they're going to be villains doing good things. That's another theory that I've seen posited. Oh, God, that's even worse. That's I mean, even especially worse. because the suicide, one of the Suicide Squads was very bad and one was very good and the good one was directed and written and basically, basically godfathered by James Gunn. And let's face it, Daniel Espinosa, Andy Serkis... And uh, Rob Fleischer, they are not, they are not James Gunn. Yeah, it's just, it's just so disappointing, man, because, like, the other thing, too, is, like, you keep thinking, like, oh, all these murders, there's a lot of people that get murdered in Morbius, for sure. All these murders going on takes place in New York City, and yet Spider-Man is nowhere to be seen or found. Like, Spider-Man would be on that shit immediately, especially if it's on the news that all these people are dying, and you see this footage of, like, people getting attacked and shit like that. It just makes no fucking sense. So I'm just like, okay, you got to, you got to back the fucking, uh, Brinks truck up and just pay Andrew Garfield, like all the money to save this fucking franchise if possible. Because like, I was thinking the whole time, that's why they moved it from January to April is because all they got, they had to have got Andrew Garfield to make this something that we can chew on and that the fans would actually want to go back and see, even though it's a bad movie, to go back and watch those end credit scenes over and over again. It's not even worth that anymore because they didn't even do that. So, uh, yeah, that, that's kind of my take on it. It's a, it's very unfortunate. I, for me personally, I would have just cut the budget in half, grounded in more, less CGI stuff, better lighting, and better colors. Uh, I would have just – the only change I would have made is not make the movie – I mean, I think that's the solution. Incorporate Morbius into the Spider-Man universe in another way. I don't know. I just, for me, putting all these characters in their own movie, uh, it just, it it has it worked because the missing component is, of course, Spider-Man. Like, Spider-Man has a really good rogues gallery, but you can't have a good Spider-Man movie without having a good Spider-Man. And, and I feel the same way that the Joker did not work because there's no Batman. And... We're going to keep doing this dance, apparently. Um, but I think we may be destined to do this forever, I guess. Which is funny that I say that because of Heath Ledger and the Dark Knight. Anyway, Brian, we um, so we have not really had a place or a space to do this. But I wanted us to talk about Bruce Willis. Um, Bruce Willis recently announced that he was going to be stepping away uh, from acting because of a debilitating... A uh, disease that is affecting his uh, mental acuity, and it's—I I don't know that it is a form of dementia or Alzheimer's, but basically, we may never see Bruce Willis in a movie again. And look, he has done some not so great work in recent years, and we are not going to talk about that. I think when we talked, it—it it certainly lends a new perspective, maybe even to his performance in Glass. 
because of just how little he is in that movie and um, some of the maybe issues that he has in with his performance. And uh, Bruce Willis is also somebody who, in terms of his personal politics, is not somebody um, that I would say I agree with. But in terms of his output, Brian, um, he is somebody that is such an important part of our lives. Die Hard, of course, is at the top of the list. But I also think about the movies that we have talked about on this podcast, um, talking about Unbreakable, which we both agree is a very, very good movie. Probably one of our favorites from M. Night Shyamalan. We have our issues with Glass, but certainly I think there is some, there's still some very good stuff in that movie. And I think part of the reason that we were excited to see Glass is because of Bruce Willis's surprise appearance at the end of Split. There's also the other movies that he's been in. There is Death Becomes Her. There is The Fifth Element. Uh, Brian, what are what are some of your favorite moments in movies from Bruce Willis? Well, for me growing up, I actually watched Death Becomes Her before Die Hard. So for me, the number one movie that comes to my head for Bruce Willis is Death Becomes Her. And I know that's kind of like obscure for some people, but to me, it's just like him with that mustache and it feels like he dropped weight for the role kind of looks like a little bit and this was like 92 and he was doing the you know i'd never seen him perform before so he was doing the comedy thing so for what i saw that first i thought he was like a comedy actor which he is but then you watch die hard and it's like he's mixing that action bravado with the comedy so he's, he's kind of got this well-rounded thing going on for him around that era and then comparing it the, the two the diehards to the diehard movies to like death becomes her and then uh, later on watching like last boy scout which I, it was okay, but I like you know Bruce Willis in that. And then the scenes I've seen of Moonlighting, like I've never seen the whole episode. I've seen those great scenes of Civil Shepherd of them going back and forth, flirting with each other. That's great stuff right there. Uh, not to mention, like, you know, I binge watched, I think, the first two seasons of Miami Vice, and he had an excellent role as, like, a, I think, a weapons dealer or something, like a really abusive, like, weapons dealer. He did a great job on that episode. So, like, there's a lot of great stuff, and I, I really love Die Hard 3 more than most people, I think, because of the whole, like, clue puzzle aspect and him trying to figure out the puzzle. Uh, like, Chester A. Arthur, I'll always remember that. Um, so, I, I really love Die Hard 3. Um, and then, of course, Sixth Sense is just, like, this moment in time where, like, uh, you know, it felt like I did not watch the movie in theaters, but I remember everyone talking about that movie and obsessing about that movie. So, that was another big moment in time. Um, yeah, man, I, I, even with Die Hard 4 coming out, I thought that was kind of like this big, like, wow, they're making a Die Hard 4, and that was 2007, and then Die Hard 5 kind of went, you know, went, came and went, but, uh, you know, a hell of a fucking run from 80, I don't know, 85 to, uh, what, 2007, you know what I mean, uh, before Cop Out, unfortunately, um, and then, you know, the Cop Out years, unfortunately, but, you know, if you look back now, you see why he's taking on these smaller roles, just to kind of like, you know, maybe just help cement his family financially, you know, at, after a certain time, after, after he passes, you know what I mean? All these roles will just add up and he's just doing it to, you know, provide for his family because he knows that he can't really act as great as he could be based on this, this uh, diagnosis. And now that he's got permanently retired, it's like, okay, um, we can only look back now and just enjoy the stuff we go, we watch. And, you know, I uh, recently just watched Con Air and because of Con Air, I'm going to watch The Rock. And because it's The Rock, I'm going to watch Armageddon. Those three those three movies always are like back to back to back for me. Or they're always going to stick out of my head as like a trio of movies that go together. And if it's going to end with Armageddon, it's going to end with Bruce Willis and Ben Affleck and, and uh, uh, Liv Tyler at the end. Like, please, no. And like, it should be me. And then, and then you, of course, you know, Bruce Willis presses the button. Epic ending. So... I remember Armageddon, man. That was a big, big rental. Big, big rental back in the day. So uh, Bruce Willis is like uh, one of those early memories as a kid, like renting a bunch of movies on VHS, and he's on the cover. And uh, I'm always going to remember that. And uh, God, man, the first time I watched Death Becomes Her, I was just like so mesmerized at the whole concept of like death coming back to life. People with giant holes in their bodies. And the whole time, Bruce Willis is the one guy selling it all with the shock on his face. Yeah, and I would say that his, probably his last truly great movie was Looper. And I, I just wanted to acknowledge that that was 10 years ago at this point. But I think you go back to that and you can clearly see just how good he is. He's not the lead in it. I would make the argument Joseph Gordon-Levitt is the lead. 
Uh, but that is one of the more innovative and interesting sci-fi movies that we've had in the 21st century. And it has certainly set Ryan Johnson on a course of being able to do a lot of his own stuff and some really interesting work uh, with Star Wars as well as Knives Out. But yeah, I mean, that's that's really all we wanted to say. Just a brief reflection on Bruce Willis and his career. And again, regardless of some of his, uh, let's say, not so good movies and maybe some of his personal beliefs, uh, he is he is an important part of our movie going experience. And I think uh, for those of us who are uh, for our age and maybe a little bit older and a little bit younger, uh, Bruce Willis is going to be somebody that continues to be important because whether you think Die Hard is a Christmas movie or not, people are going to be watching Die Hard every single year at Christmas. Uh, Fifth Element is going to be a movie that that people explore and talk about as being a great work of science fiction. Um, there is also Death Becomes Her, which is basically, um, in terms of the LGBTQ plus community, is really important. And uh, Brian, we haven't mentioned this, but Pulp Fiction, maybe one of the greatest movies ever made. Bruce Willis is a part of that. So that is, I mean, he has been in a number of iconic roles. He has worked with a number of directors who, you know, before they became icons, like Bruce Willis worked with them, like working with Tarantino in 1994, working with Ryan Johnson in 2012. Like this guy is somebody who is truly, who truly has had a wide ranging career. And he has admittedly also made a lot of crap and is cashed in on that, that John McClane persona with two awful diehard sequels and even the commercial. But um, I think in the end, you know, I think you were, we're, 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 people are just going to ignore diehards four and five and they're going to watch the first three diehards and and they're going to focus on, on the good stuff he's done and not the eight movies that he did in 2021 that are not great. So uh, that's that's how I'm going to choose to remember him in terms of his uh, his output. And uh, yeah, that's uh, that's really all I have to say, Brian. Any uh, any additional thoughts before uh, we call it? I completely forgot about Fifth Element and Pulp Fiction, which is crazy to me. But yeah, I mean Fifth Element, I saw as a kid and I did not understand at all. But then, like the third time around on like HBO and like the early 2000s, I finally kind of got into it. And uh, yeah, he's such a Vital because he sticks out like a sore thumb in that movie, doesn't he? Because he's like the most straight laced guy in that movie. Everyone else is like so like like crazy character wise, you know what I mean? Like especially Chris Tucker. It's fucking like a, such a contrast with those two in that movie. So yeah, he knows how to do it, man. And uh fuck, I guess I have to watch Hudson Hawk now because that's that's been on my list to watch forever. Yeah, I mean there's a lot of movies that I feel like I can watch. Um yeah, that's uh, that's really it. So uh, I think we we talked about Bruce Willis maybe just as long as we talked about Morbius, uh, which I don't even know if that's fair because Bruce Willis deserves a lot of our time. And hopefully uh, we could do some sort of longer reflection on his performances at some point this year. Uh, but that is it for us. Uh, we will be back next week with another episode of Hero Pantheon for Brian. My name is Jerome. We will talk to you again next week. Why the hell does Morbius need a car? He can fly. <laughs>